Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Tech Exception. And today we have an exceptional conversation with Yaron Khabib. And Yaron Khabib is the co-founder of Iguazio, co-founder and CTO. Hi, Yaron. How are you? Hi, Adi. Pleasure being here. I'm excited to have you. I know Iguazio is building one of the most sophisticated platforms we have today. Maybe you can share a bit more about what is it you do there. So Iguazio is a data science platform. And the main goal of uh, Iguazu is to accelerate the operationalization of machine learning and AI. Essentially, if you're building uh, something in the research, you want to get it to production, whether it's a machine learning uh, pipeline, something that involves data, you know, data analysis and, you know, all that. Uh, it's, we're making it really easy to move it into something that, you know, helps the business, a real application. You know, think of like fraud detection, uh, and uh, recommendation engines, uh, like predictive maintenance. The main struggle in machine learning is you have something working in the lab, but then it takes a year to make something real out of it. Uh, this is where we come in. We, we make it in weeks instead of uh, a year. Yeah, definitely. One of the challenges we see is uh, data scientists and machine learning researcher work on state-of-the-art algorithms, develop the best machine learning models that you know we can use, but then it takes like, few months to a year to actually be deployed into production and then most companies kind of lose the momentum of you know the state of the art algorithm or the state of the art model because hey you know the competition already developed something similar but they were just faster to deploy it and put it in production uh, and you also mentioned you work uh, with data and data analytics so how exactly uh, does it look like uh, from Iguazio point of view so if you think about machine learning, everyone is focusing on like auto ML, the algorithm side, et cetera. But this is pretty well understood, you know, to just take, uh, create a model, you know, if you have the right data, you just run like XGBoost or some, you know, scikit-learn and you get a model. So it's not sophisticated, especially today that every vendor wraps it up with some sort of nice UI. You just, you know, put a data frame in and you get a model. So that's not really where the, the challenge is. The real challenge is, is getting the data, the right data, into the model, you know, sort of the feature preparation. Uh, this is where you see a lot of efforts today in the industry around what, what is referred to as uh, feature stores. Uh, and the biggest challenge is not really preparing the data for the training because, again, you know, the training, you don't have a sense of urgency, especially in exploration. So you could just go and, you know, like uh, run some SQL queries, run some pandas, and you get a data set and you throw it into training. But the real challenge is what do you do in real life? Like, let's assume you're building like a fraud detection or fraud prevention system. The data used for serving or for uh, infer inferencing the, the model is live data that comes from uh, streaming, from uh, customer last balance, you know, customer last transaction, uh, last uh, week's activity. You know, when did he last, when was the last time he bought shoes or whatever? Um, how do you generate those features in production? Well, data is, uh, you know, keeps on moving uh, to fit it into a model because the model is expecting a set of parameters. And if you're not going to give it exactly the set of parameters you were using in training with the same math, with the same distribution, et cetera, your model is actually not going to perform. So we're doing a lot of effort uh, there to essentially allow people to build the same data uh, pipeline, which prepares the features for training and sort of in one click transition it into something sort of real time that allow you to feed the model in real time with live data instead of sort of uh, historical and log data. Yeah. So you mentioned the feature store and you mentioned the complexity of putting together the data pipeline. Uh, what are, uh, you know, in this space, there's a lot of uh, different complexities. Like if you want to do uh, streaming uh, and you inject the data in streaming or you inject the data in batch. So what are uh, the challenges that you see uh, when you work with different customers? <clears throat> so, um, you know, first let's think of a data scientist, write some code in Jupyter Notebook, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. And when you want to go into production, you can't just take a notebook that has like, you know, a train section and a sort of a evaluate section, et cetera, and just run it in production. It doesn't work because in production, you have a lot more data, it thinks the scale, you have a sensitivity around like performance, you have to support X amount of transactions per second, or you need to respond relatively quickly to a user request over a web. Uh, so what you really need to do is the first thing is transition it to like a container, you know, like a microservice um, and also address all the aspects of scaling and, and all of that. Now think of the poor data scientist. He only wants to write some 
nice algorithms and, and make it the best algorithms. It doesn't really want to think about operational aspect of how do you address data security, how to address scaling out your computation, how do you do uh, partitioning your data and scaling out your, your data access, uh, how to address security. This is the main challenge that we see. People are sort of, okay, I have this great model in the lab. Now I want to build something out of it and I want to, to run it in production. How do I really do it? You know, I have a pretty fancy uh, Jupyter notebook. How do I make this notebook uh, something that really runs and uh, you know listens on a stream or an, an HTTP webhook or, or something like that and really produces results that are meaningful to the business beyond sort of this playground. What we see in many cases is that the data scientist doesn't know how to do it, so he keeps on improving his model. You know, it's just like make it better and better and more, you know, more and more theory behind it, but it never gets to production. And in order to gain some business value out of it, businesses have to put it in some real application. You know, the first days of the machine learning was, okay, I'm gonna show you a chart, you know, like all those COVID charts now, like this is, you know, the situation and this is what we should have done, et cetera. No one does anything with charts. You want to apply machine learning in a way just like Facebook or Google or, or, uh, or Azure uh, does it for different business application. You know, that when you're doing something, a, a chatbot already tells you what you need to do, how to complete your email, et cetera. And that's much harder than building something that you can show off a nice dashboard and show to your boss and, you know, no one does anything with it. Yeah, definitely. The more uh, actionable thing that you can do is not just show the dashboard or show the report. Is actually give the recommendation or even you know act on the recommendation of what's to do next and make it uh, automate as much as we can. Especially when we talk about machine learning, it's like how do we do the next step from analytics and how do we take the next step from just reporting on the problem, but actually taking. Uh, um, doing an action and, and, and working on the problem and being more proactive on it. Absolutely, it's one of, of the challenges uh, and the areas to grow that we see. And you mentioned the data scientists, and I know in that area, uh, most of the data scientists are not always, you know, proficient on software development. They're very, uh, they know uh, well the math behind machine learning algorithms, and they know the statistics. And they, you know, some some of them will have a PhD, and they're specializing in machine learning or even specializing in different uh, domains and work with machine learning to solve those issues. Uh, so, what are the different persona that you see when we talk about this end-to-end uh, -end machine learning process and productionizing machine learning? So first, it's obvious that we have multiple personas, and that's the, the key uh, challenge is that you have a data scientist, which is very proficient in the algorithm side, and you know there are more and more coding uh, going into uh, data science because especially as you go into deep learning, people have to understand some Python is at the minimum you know, to deal with like TensorFlow, or PyTorch, et cetera. Uh, but there's still, this is their focus, is how to build a neural network layers and, and all of that. Uh, and then you have a data engineer, uh, which is more focused on like data optimization tricks, how to run the, the queries uh, better, how to do caching, how to do partitioning, uh, how to run stream processing and, and thing, things like that. And, and you have the, the DevOps, who knows how to take those kind of things and put them on like a Kubernetes cluster in microservices and monitor that and have some live dashboards for activities. And you may have some software developers because essentially there is potentially some sort of front-end application or some glue logic that needs to be written to connect the different dots. So essentially you have at least four personas in every, in every project. Now, uh, what we've seen, the successful organizations in machine learning are the ones that know how to harness those four disciplines as, as one uh, working team. Uh, because in many organizations, especially legacy organizations, you know, data science wasn't initially uh, used for like real application. It was more sort of the uh, BI analysis team, business analysis, business analysts, et cetera. So they you'd have used uh, to go to some data warehouse, you know, get some queries or an Excel spreadsheet or CSVs run some analysis and generate some reports. So they weren't sort of proficient with like creating something like, you know, a Facebook or a sort of a more modern um, web web systems that, you know, all its life is around the sort of the AI and ML and continuous learning. Uh, so so we had different disciplines. We have those guys that generate some model and then they, we call it sort of throw over the wall. They send it to another team in some other place, tell them go and productize it. So. 
The other team is usually not even aware of all the data science technologies. It doesn't like Python. They usually work with Java, sometimes even C, uh, or maybe they're using sort of a Spark and Hadoop. So what they'll do, they'll rewrite the entire code or the entire model into what they're what they're uh, capable of, or what they know, like you know, rewrite to Scala or Java or something like that. And then you lose some of the some things in translation. You know, it's just like this thing where you write on someone's back and he needs to draw again the same drawing. You know, you you lose the you lose some of the data, and the model won't be the same accuracy because if someone you know say, oh, I don't need this rounding. I'll just do a seal or whatever. So rounding, you don't get the same result. So, um, but also because you have those silos, you don't get anything done because now the data science goes back saying, you know what, I forgot. I want to add this algorithm. It, it, throws it over the wall again, those guys redo the entire process. And he needs to go to like an engineering manager, tell him we need to do this, et cetera, and you know, all the negotiations. So the first thing we need to do is collaborate as a team and create tools for all, everyone to work together. And this is what we're essentially what we're doing on our platform is one platform where there's collaboration through a notion we'll talk in a minute, sort of more composable, AI and machine learning using the concept of functions. And so everyone works together on the same thing. And you have continuous improvement and you deliver things much faster into production. And also iteratively, you can do it again and again. Every time you need to do a change, it will, you know, in a week, you're, you're already publishing this change. So which Microsoft technologies are you working uh, with, uh, you know, today to enable your solution or integrate with different parts? Uh, so we're working closely with uh, with Microsoft and with, with Azure uh, on different uh, areas. We're working on, on some areas where it's sort of hybrid configurations and you have sort of edge, you know, facilities or Azure stack on one place and Azure cloud uh, on the other. Uh, we're working on Kubernetes. So obviously we're working with Azure uh, Kubernetes AKS uh, service. Uh, we're working with, uh, you know, obviously VMs, uh, blob storage. Uh, we work with, with uh, Microsoft customers, essentially, because we're a platform, then we're not necessarily like direct Azure customers. We're selling a platform on Azure for our customers. So uh, our, we, we integrate together around things like, uh, you know, we have customers that works with Azure DevOps. So essentially, they're creating an automated uh, pipeline for delivery to production using uh, Azure DevOps and, and our solution. So, and again, there are many different uh, tools that are incorporated as part of a, a joint solution to to customers, and obviously there is like Azure ML where people can develop models in a Azure ML, and we can plug into that. And from uh, Azure ML, they can actually publish sort of uh, real time pipelines or serving uh, functions or distributed uh, training and things like that. That's really cool, especially the uh, distributed uh, training. I know it's like one of the hardest challenges uh, that we see in machine learning because we know it's uh, around data is garbage in, garbage out, and we want to have more data uh, to build our models with more data. And so distributed training definitely comes into play when we have this huge amount of data because it's you know it just doesn't fit in, in the memory of one machine and we need multiple machines and to do it more efficiently um, and more organized as well. Uh, so what do you think uh, holds for the future for Iguazio from your point of view? So you know, the way we're addressing some of the things that you just said is like the main concept that we have is think of it sort of like serverless functions. You know, serverless function is not a new, uh, is not a new idea. It's just usually rarely used in machine learning and data engineering because it's not for like heavyweight tasks. Uh, one of the things that we've done is that you can take a snippet of code and push it into our serverless, distributed serverless engine, and they know how to scale out very heavyweight workloads like training, data preparation, uh, serving in real time, stream processing, and things like that. This is really what makes this ability to take a snippet of code that even a data scientist writes, and we know how to accelerate the code, give it better performance, add security, instrumentation, logging, etc. And even you know tough tasks, as you mentioned, like training, we know how to uh, train a model on like 20 servers as if it was only one. You just like submit a piece of code and it just gets sharded and distributed and everything gets collected, etc. So uh, the other main piece of our solution is the data layer where we have an extremely high performance, low latency, uh, sort of distributed uh, database that allows us to essentially shard and partition those workloads. Like we can 
essentially now take a training job and just distribute the data into a fabric and get all those sort of workers process it. Same for analytics task or or other heavyweight tasks. So this is essentially the two core components that we have. You know, extremely uh, fast distributed data layer and and also sort of a very automated sort of uh, ability to compose functions and execute them uh, at high speeds and, and the ability to compose those into sort of real-time pipelines or sort of uh, machine learning pipelines in a really easy way. Uh, and again, collaborating with, with Microsoft. So, so we see that trend more and more organizations are essentially moving into this operationization phase. They sort of fed up with this, what we discussed before, you know, reporting and all that. Uh, they want to get ROI out of their machine learning and AI teams. So they have to incorporate into business uh, problems. And we see that we've already done a lot of projects with uh, many cus big customers, you know, for fraud preventions, for real-time recommendation engines, for uh, predictive maintenance, even healthcare uh, and ICUs and, and, you know, very uh, interesting, you know, airport uh, real-time airport maintenance, although now there's not a lot of traffic in airports. Uh, so we know how to do it. We know how to take like uh, some theory, some algorithms and publish it into uh, a fully managed machine learning pipeline that works in a, with full operationalization in mind in, man, in a matter of weeks, if you'll see some of our uh, customer quotes. So I think more and more organizations are going to be challenged with this approach. Everyone wants to uh, bring ROI to their machine learning and, and AI. Everyone can find an application within his business where he can bring more value. I think especially today with all the COVID, you see that AI is, is uh, becoming more and more prevalent because people need the help of machines to get their decisions and, and, and understand how to, to work more uh, eff efficiently. Um, so, you know, our, our main uh, thing is to see more and more customers adopting this Operationization, and we want to be the one that helps them achieve those those goals. Absolutely. So the future is productionizing AI and enabling a to end uh, to end AI and machine learning in a serverless approach, basically. Right. Essentially, we want to democratize AI because again, if you you know Microsoft internally, and you know again Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Netflix and all those large companies, they all use. AI as a very dominant technology in their in their stack, okay? Uh, and I think uh, that makes us, everyone thinks that everyone is doing AI, everyone is doing ML, you know, everyone has data scientists. But in practice, 80% of the enterprises haven't gotten to that phase of knowing how to uh, utilize their data and harnessing it into solving business problems like the web companies did. And I think this is really where uh, people now, you know, it's not that everyone is really doing it. You know, don't believe the, the papers. Most people probably don't know how to operationalize their machine learning and AI. Uh, so you're not alone. You just, uh, and we can help you with your with your efforts on getting there and becoming sort of more like a LinkedIn and a Twitter in, in applied machine learning into your applications. Perfect. All right, thank you so much, Yaron, for coming uh, to our show in Tech Exceptions and sharing all your vast knowledge and everything that you see from the community and definitely you know, assuring us that the future is with data and AI. Uh, so thank you again and looking forward to hear more what Iguazio is you know, going to put out next. Sure, and thank you, Adi, for inviting us. And again, Azure is a great uh, partner for us. Uh, we love uh, using Microsoft and and also partnering with Microsoft. So thanks again for the opportunity. Absolutely. All right, talk soon.